the bi-weekly new seminars that the Urban Institute of Bioethics hosts. Today we're actually um, pleased to co-host the seminar with the Department of Health Policy and Management in the School of Public Health. And Colleen Berry, who's chair of that department, is here. So thank you um, for helping us bring um, to, the, um, to Baltimore and to Hopkins campus. So that's my privilege to introduce our speaker today. You can see from the slide behind me is Dominic Sissi. Dom is director of the Scattergate Program for the Applied Ethics of Behavioral Health Care and an assistant professor in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, of course. His research examines the ethics of mental health care services and policies, including long-term psychiatric care for individuals with serious mental illness and ethical issues in prison and jail health care, which, of course, he's going to be talking with us about today in just a moment. Just by way of um, Don's background, he received his bachelor's degree in biology from Villanova University, of course, in Philadelphia, a master's of bioethics from the University of Pennsylvania, and a doctorate in philosophy from Michigan State University. I was saying to him, I can talk to him even though my children are both University of Michigan alums. <laughs> so we're really pleased to have Don visiting us here in Baltimore and at Hopkins. Thanks again, um, Colleen, for co-sponsoring with us, and welcome, Don, to Johns Hopkins. Thank you for that kind introduction, Jeff, and I'm actually really privileged and honored to be here, to be invited to come speak with you all. Um, before I get into my talk, let me just make a few um, acknowledgments. <clears throat> I want to be sure to thank the Skyward Behavioral Health Foundation, which sponsors much of my research. Um, I've also received some funding for the research you'll hear about today from the London Davis Institute at Penn and the Department of Medical Ethics, of course. I have no um, conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, so, um, before, again, before we get started, let me, <laughs> let me just kind of give you a little bit of a personal note here um, about why I decided to really focus some of my time and effort on ethical challenges inside jails and prisons. Um, Back in, I guess it was in 2015 at ASBH, um, Professor Renee Fox received uh, the Beecher Award. And in her lecture, um, she made a uh, point that she'd been making now for like 40 years, uh, which is that uh, bioethics as a field hasn't really addressed macroscopic social justice challenges or issues. And she used the uh, example of child, child poverty as an example bioethicists really should be taken on as, a, as an issue that's, um, that's well within the scope of our field um, and, 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 and sort of describe how we as bioethicists tend towards sexier topics that may be interesting and fun for the media but also that don't really have the same purchase in real life that some of these bigger questions may have. And so she implored us as a field and has been challenging, challenging us as a field for years to think bigger to think about the, the most vulnerable in our society. And so early on in my time at Penn, I got to interact and spend time with Renee, and she's become a bit of a mentor to me. Um, and in, in, in our conversations, you know, she really pressed upon me the need to like, expand out my thinking about mental health care, ethics, and policy, and look at the jails. And, and I did. And so, um, you know, as I began the process of getting inside, I realized I might be one of the few bioethicists that's actually doing clinical ethics inside the correctional facilities. Now, bioethicists, as, as you all know, have been inside jails and prisons since you know the early days of the field and you know, um, uh, dating back to the Belmont report. Um, but it was in the context of understanding the um, the vulnerabilities of prisoners as research subjects, mostly. So most of the bioethics stuff inside carceral settings was around research ethics. There isn't a whole lot that I know of, other than some work by Nancy Dubler and some others, and now uh, um, uh, Paul Christopher Brown and some, some bioethicists around the country are starting to look at jails in a more systematic way. So I really thought to myself, geez, this is like one population that is like, you know, multi at multiple levels, highly stigmatized, highly vulnerable, and psychiatric hospitals that evaporate, I'll get into that in a minute. This is, this is the place where individuals with serious mental illness are more and more finding themselves for treatments. And so, 
basically that set up my um, this vertical in my research program that's become a pretty significant part of, of my, my overall research portfolio. And so today's presentation, I'm going to try to give you a sense of that entire research um, sort of portfolio, but, but you know, with some specific examples. And so let me just I'll start by describing the scope and ethical importance of the issue of, of correctional mental health care. Um, and I'll use, I'll, I'll present some empirical data that my team and I have, um, have, have gathered to illustrate some of the common ethical challenges that correctional mental health care providers face on a daily basis. And then um, I'll follow that by offering a partial solution that may help address this gigantic social justice problem that I, you know, that, that I see inside jails and prisons with seriously mentally ill people by by making a rather provocative claim that we need to reimagine um, psychiatric asylums um, such that we have more inpatient capacity for long-term treatment. So just for the first, getting into the first section of the talk, I really want to make a very basic straightforward ethics claim um, that I don't think you need a PhD in moral philosophy to kind of come up with, actually. It's very straightforward. It's that incarcerated individuals deserve the mental health treatment they need at the appropriate time and in the appropriate setting. Um, you know, in most cases, these three conditions for ethical mental health care cannot be met by definition inside a jail or prison. This is, you know, not it. This is, and I'll explain why that is, why these, these two kinds of, uh, these three conditions are um, non-starters in an institution that is not designed to provide therapeutic um, interventions, but it's rather a place for confinement and retribution. Um, it's not an ethics claim only that, you know, what I just said, that these folks deserve mental health care treatment in the right time in the right place. This is also based in a, this is a constitutional right, in fact. The, um, the idea that um, individuals inside jails and prisons have a right to health care, which is, by the way, a right that we on the outside don't enjoy, um, has been with us really since pressing cases in the 1970s, including Estelle versus Gamble, where the Supreme Court recognized prisoners have a constitutional right to health care, something you know, because we don't have that, but they have it inside jails and prisons because they've been taken out of the community and they're limited in the scope of what they can avail themselves for health care. So they have a right that should be afforded um, health care in, in prison that's of um, uh, equivalence to what would be out in the community. And that includes mental health care. So the scope of the problem, we've got millions of individuals, 2.4 to 3 million individuals incarcerated in the U.S., which is by far the world's highest incarceration rate, about 700 people per 100,000. We're in a totally different universe than every other developed nation. And um, even, you know, second on the list, Russia would be second on the list, so I don't think you remember the NCAA. They're only at about 500. So it's, you know, we're out here in um, sort of a, 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 an alternative universe of, of mass incarceration. Um, 5% of the world's population exists in the United States, but 25% of the global population of prisoners is here in our jails and prisons. Um, in absolute terms, terms, the population of our jails and prisons is equivalent to the population of Chicago. We should distinguish between jails and prisons. I've been using them simultaneously. We should distinguish. Jails are local and municipal run facilities, estimating you know, we have about 750 or a million people at any given day inside of a jail. Um, uh, 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 Eleven point four million people kind of churn through jails over the course of a single year. These are people who are arrested and um, are awaiting trial because they can't make bail at the times, or they're serving sentences for less than two years, so they'd be in a jail. Prisons account for about one point five million people, and these are folks who are sentenced to more than two years, or more than two years of, um, of um, confinement. Um, of this enormous prisoner population, about 50% have a mental illness, and about 15 to 20% have a serious mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder. And I would also put in personality disorder, cluster B personality disorders, as a, 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 even though it's not technically an SMI, I would say it is in this case. There are about 400,000 people living in jail, as we sit here today, with a serious mental illness, and this equates to Again, in absolute terms, the population is Staten Island. It's a staggering number, and so um, I think it's fair to say, I, I use this term to kind of illustrate that the scope of this issue is that we have actually a, set, a mental health care system, a shadow health care system, inside our jails and prisons that's delivering a lot of medical care, 
kind of in the, in the shadows. And so you wonder, how did we get to this point? Well, I would argue a paucity of psychiatric hospital beds, scarcity of community mental health resources, deficits in affordable housing, and of course draconian and racist sentencing guidelines resulted in transinstitutionalization of individuals with mental illness out of appropriate therapeutic settings and into carceral settings. Let me just pause for a moment, because I use the term transinstitutionalization and I've been kind of getting to the point where I'm going to say mental illness has been criminalized. These are kind of debatable, controversial terms, so let me just stipulate what I want to, how I want to define these terms. Criminalization of mental illness to me means that the behaviors associated with mental illness was, or the behavior was, a significant proximate factor in the individual's involvement in the criminal justice system. Um, Transinstitutionalization refers not to like the literal taking of individuals out of psychiatric hospitals to jails, right? That's, that's the wrong way to think about it. It's this gradual shift in the placement of individuals who have serious mental illness from one institutional sector to another, okay? And that's represented often in terms of, this, this graph is kind of a famous, now sort of, depending on who, have, what you think of a famous or infamous graph that shows the inverse correlation between the uh, evaporation of psychiatric hospital bed space and the in increase in um, individuals in psych jails and prisons. And you know, you can see the red line significantly dips around 1965. <coughs> This marks the beginning of what was known as the period of deinstitutionalization. Many, of different, many hospitals, state hospitals were closed or beginning to be closed. But there was a time when there were about 500 beds per 100,000 people in the country. Now we're down to around 20, 15 to 20, depending on how you add them up. Um, you know, let me, let me just be clear about this. Not to say that back in 1950, all those 500 to 100,000 100, people, those beds were good. They weren't. These were not the greatest places, as you know, and most, you know, media portrayals of the asylums back in those days were of warehouses that were pretty abusive you know, type of places. But there was, a, there was a place for these individuals, and some places were actually really good, we don't hear about those, but that's a separate story. What, um, what we can see, though, is that there is this increase in, um, in, in, in incarceration. Now, obviously, correlation doesn't mean causation, and, you know, Greenhouse gas also increased at the same rate, you know, sort of in the same trajectory, so it's like not connected. But there is, I think, an intuitive, an intuitive um, connection to these, these two phenomena. And it's better, I think, represented with this graph, which shows how the number of individuals with SMI that were once hospitalized, you know, in 19, was it 60, at 500 or so thousand, um, now we're down to about 63,000 that are hospitalized versus individuals who are incarcerated with SMI at 55,000, now we're up to over 400, I would say it's over 400,000 at this point. So you can see that, that that way of thinking about it, I think it makes it more clear that there has been this criminalization of SMI over the past 40 or 50 years. Um, um, I've previewed sort of my answer to the serious problem that we need is more therapeutic settings for this bed, and I'm reiterating an argument from an essay I wrote with Zeke Emanuel and Andrew Siegel in, uh, entitled uh, Improving Long-Term Psychiatric Care, Bring Back the Asylum, which I'll get into in the second part of this talk. But this, um, this is an example here of um, this the basic argument that, uh, and this is from a paper that Steve Sharpstein and Elizabeth Sinclair, I'll call Bedless Psychiatry, Integrating Behavioral Health Care Capacity, or improving, Rebuilding <laughs> Behavioral Health Care Service Capacity. And you know, it touches on a couple of key issues that we noticed, or that you know, has been reported in um, uh, across the country, which is that lots of mentally ill people are appearing in emergency rooms, for example, they're being boarded for days or even weeks. Some individuals with serious mental illness find themselves in scatter, what are called scatter beds in acute care settings. Not exactly the type of place you would want to have a person, um, you know, uh, avail themselves of longitudinal long-term care um, for a serious mental illness. And, you know, there's a number of reasons for this therapy of beds, and one of them is, I think, the IMD exclusion. Um, this is the, a rule that Medicaid, uh, that's, that's part of the Medicare Medicaid bills from early, from 1965, that say you, know, you can't have, uh, we, we will, we, the federal government, will not reimburse for care in large psychiatric settings that have more than 16 beds. It was a, 
way that this is de-incentivized the creation of large psychiatric hospitals where we be warehousing people. But today, it acts as a disincentive for scaling up um, inpatient treatment um, possibilities in various states unless that state gets a waiver to, to expand beyond 16 beds. So this is just to say that there's various problems and obstacles in getting patients with serious mental illness the treatment they need at the right time. Now, if we think about the criminalization of individuals with serious mental illness, um, the idea is, I think, encapsulated best by um, Richard Lamb, who was a, a psychiatrist working on this issue since the beginning of the institutionalization. He's been writing since the late 1960. And he says, many of the persons with serious mental illness that one sees today in our jails and prisons could have just as easily been hospitalized had the psychiatric beds been available. This is especially true for those who commit minor crimes. I think he's right. I mean, I think if you look at some of the reports, this is a, a, an infogram from the Vera Institute. They did a report several years ago that showed that there are about 730,000 people in jail on any given day. And of these people, 75% uh, committed nonviolent crimes. You know, these are crimes of maybe social disruption, crimes of survival, retail theft, things like this. Uh, and, and they're languishing inside jails and prisons because they can't make bail. So basically what we have is debtor prison for mentally ill people, essentially. Um, in certain places like Philly, for example, we're trying to go bail, we're trying to eliminate bail. Uh, for this, you know, this reason and many others. But, you know, at this point, you know, of the population that's hanging out in, in jail waiting trial because they don't have access to bail money, uh, 14 to 30 percent um, have serious mental illness um, in jail at a rate four to six times that of the population. So 14 to 31 percent of folks hanging around waiting. And, you know, in Philly, they can wait um, for weeks, months, even years. Um, and I'll show you some statistics about that in a minute. But uh, it's not always the case that inmates will languish inside of jail. Just uh, a few months ago, ProPublica, for example, reported that some wardens and super jail superintendents recognize that we can't pay for their mental health care because the money to pay for health care comes from the jail budget. Doesn't come from anywhere else. They can't use federal funds. They can't use any Medicare, or Medicaid. So, what these these very uh, sort of clever superintendents do is they send the inmate out on a recognizance bond, so they can go and get health care at a hospital. But then they get you know sort of like a leash, and then they get pulled back into jail after they've been treated. So the jail, so the hospital usually is the hospital or some other. Um, organization that can cover for indigent care has to pick up the tab. So wardens now have figured out ways to shift that cost. There's some really progressive uh, jail superintendents and wardens out there that understand that their facilities are essentially mental health care facilities now. This is a guy named Tom Dart, who's the sheriff of Cook County, and he's a really interesting guy. He's a he's a Jesuit trained uh, sort of humanities guy that somehow found himself running a gym. And if you talk to him, he'll say, you know, I never thought I'd be doing this, but I'm here for a reason, and I see this as one of the worst social, um, one of the worst crises in our country. And it, it is barbaric how we treat people inside jails and prisons, especially people who are sick. So he's taken, you know, he's, he's done some really innovative things in Cook County, from everything from creating you know, special housing arrangements for people with certain mental illnesses to, to find safety and, and have treatment in a, in a place that makes better sense within the jail, um, to creating um, sort of re-entry programs for people with mental health conditions that allows them to actually follow up and get care. So he's, he's created a, a, a fleet of vans that will actually take uh, recently released individuals to their doctor's appointment to help them fill prescriptions, to do all these things that often are not done. In fact, in Philly, one of the biggest challenges is getting folks back on Medicaid once they've re-entered so that they can then fill scripts and get all that. So, you know, there's all these, like, obstacles both on the front end and inside and on the back end. And guys like Tom Dart are thinking critically about how we can meet the needs of this population. He's done all sorts of really important rehabilitative, like, activities that create sort of um, programs that are now being replicated across the country. This is just one about job training and making pizza, although 
I think they're making deep dish pizza, which doesn't really count. But anyway, uh, he's got a whole program that's, that's super interesting and good, and he's, he's great. Um, so that gives you just a sense of, you know, we've got all these folks in jail, they're really sick, they're, they have serious mental illnesses, and <clears throat> so it makes, you know, as a mind medical ethicist, it makes me sort of wonder, well, how do the clinicians handle, how do the, how do the clinicians actually um, do their job um, and meet their professional standards and expectations in this, you know, carceral setting, a total institution? And so, my team and I, we went out and started surveying, uh, doing interviews and focus groups with, um, with jail clinicians, mental health clinicians. And so what I'll do now is just kind of give you some sense of their, um, their reflections that we've, we've um, in one case published, and in another case, or some data that isn't published quite yet. Um, and and this, these are some of the themes that really do emerge is that, you know, there's really deep concerns about being able to be a clinical social worker, a psychologist, in a few cases a psychiatrist, in a place where individuals really aren't given giving informed consent in the traditional sense. They're being forced to treatment often, or coerced into treatment. They're being sometimes restrained physically, um, or the place of solitary confinement. That's a problem. And I'll, I'll give you some, some more granular details on each of these in a second. I'll just go through the list. There's you know, a very fundamental conflict between the security apparatus and the therapeutic goals of the healthcare department within the, the jail. So you see a lot of a lot of conflict between security and therapy um, based or sort of intentions. Um, and, and usually security wins. Usually security gets to call the shots. And that, that drives some of the clinicians kind of nuts because they understand that you can't, you know, there's certain ways to take care of these folks and some of the security policies are not heard and anything but to an actual therapeutic. Um, so there's that. There's a dual agency problem where forensic clinicians are kind of, again, it's, you know, security versus therapy. It's, it's, it's unclear whose side they're on, both, you know, to incarcerated individuals, but also, like, they're sort of ambivalent sometimes about their role. And then um, access to good enough care, so the idea that clinicians feel like, all right, we're not doing what we should be doing, but at least it's something, and something's better than nothing. And then big issues around, you know, the idea that you see you're working with resident and inmates or incarcerated individuals who are incapacitated. And, you know, you want to um, get them to have capacity so they can go stay in trial and then move on to the next stage. But also at the same time, capacity restoration might harm them um, long term because they might end up in a more um, strict or more, you know, they might end up in a different penitentiary that's more dangerous. So there's like really interesting questions about what, what you're doing as a clinician to both treat the patient but also help them along this process of you know, the criminal justice system that may lead to everything from longer term imprisonment to even death penalty. You know? So really interesting. Um, this is you know, an example of, of, of a um, um, you know, restriction. And clinicians you know, sometimes have to initiate this treatment um, who may be an, an individual who may be agitated or refusing treatment or in danger to themselves or others. Um, or to the security of the jail. Um, in some prisons and jail, some jails in, in Pennsylvania, you know, this is the first, this is the first step before any kind of chemical or medical sedation. Um, there are, you know, Bell County Jail, for, for example, where I did some research, they don't have a license to provide IM sedatives in, this, in the jail itself. You have to actually take the patient out of the jail to a local hospital. So that's a lot of time, a lot of work requires shift changes and you know these places run like you know very fine oil machines usually so you've got to take a person out of the place that means having security get in the you know the van with them it's a disruptive thing so they try not to and that ends up leading to things you know episodes like this um, had the person you know been in an appropriate therapeutic setting in the first place one would argue their agitation might have been less likely. If they did get agitated, they wouldn't be using you know, barbaric interventions like this. It would be medical interventions that might be more humane. Um, and so our, you know, the clinicians described how that was, uh, was really you know, hard, hard to see. And so some of these, um, you know, some, many of these um, things I'm talking about were published in this paper, including that, that bit about, um, about 
uh, restraint use. And so, you know, some of the pithy quotes from our qualitative research are, and here's one that said, you know, now this is our last line of defense. We have a padded cell, so if they can get out of control, we say, okay, let them go in there and quiet down. But when they're escalated, it's like a trial, so at least we put them in a four-point restraint, and it has to be, again, they have to be assessed by medical, and it has to be under the director, because security is famous for, for saying, call in four-point restraints, anytime, pretty much anytime. And the clinicians have to stop and say, wait, let's do something else. Um, you know, likewise, solitary confinement. This is a, a this this is, is is considered torture in every other developed country in, in the world, the use of solitary confinement, yet we do it um, like routinely in the United States. In fact, um, there's probably let's a couple hundred thousand, well, let's say like the latest number is like a hundred thousand individuals with mental illness are in solitary confinement as we sit here today. Many of these folks have been there for years in prisons, right? And um, we should note that you know, a, lot, a lot of these individuals are placed in confinement, in solitary confinement, for their own, ostensibly for their own protection, so they're not in the general population where they, can, where they might be victimized. At least that's the justification that's sometimes made on the part of the corrections people. Um, in treatment, you know, the Treatment Advocacy Center, for example, found out 7% of jails reporting to segregate inmates with mental illness. So, like, it's pretty much a common practice. Um, and, you know, if you, I don't know if you've ever been, anyone's ever been inside a jail or seen a solitary, a, a, you know, a solitary cell, but it's, it's probably about as big as those Hopkins Manor, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, and they're in it for 23 hours a day. They get to go out for one hour, um, have a meal, shower, maybe make a phone call, maybe see a doctor. Um, and you know, the, this is a this is actually a nice uh, sort of you know, visual um, sort of latch gate here. Most solitary cells have doors on them that have very like a window like that, but it's like rated glass so that like you can't they can't actually make eye contact with people on the other side. It's, a subtle thing, but I think it's a it's a, a real like a thoughtful design that is you know dehumanizing in a sense. Like it's been intentionally designed that way. Um, and of course, the NPA has stated unequivocally that you know the placement of people with serious mental illness in these settings um, and in solitary is, is a bad thing. It's contraindicated um, for the mental health. Um, and you know I've um, I've seen. Many cases, I, I was involved in one particular case involving a guy with very serious psychiatric illness who was placed in solitary and decompensated and almost you know, died in his own filth and hypothermia because uh, he was left to his own devices and unsupervised. And that's not an uncommon thing. There's been a couple of recent cases in Alabama. I've heard about Jay Z's just gotten involved in one, in one group of cases in, in Mississippi. Um, this is not an uncommon thing. And so when you're a clinician, and you're um, trying to figure out how you're going to do about best by your patient. Should you uh, should you facilitate their move, you know, their, their transfer into solitary if you think it's going to be safer for them than general pop? Given what you know about the um, the effects of solitary on severely mentally ill individuals, this is a recent study that was in JAMA um, about a month ago uh, or two months ago that shows the uh, mortality rates associated with restricted housing, um, so like mortality after release of people who had spent time in solitary, the, um, the numbers are really stark. I mean, the, the, um, there's, there's a significant, there's a two-fold um, increase in the odds of suicide among individuals who had spent time in solitary. So the downstream effects of solitary confinement are really significant. So you wonder as a clinician, Okay, maybe they'll be, they'll be safe for the next week or two, but, you know, whenever a gang member that's after them will, um, you know, they won't be able to have access, but at the same time, will that, what are the long, longer term ramifications for the individual? And why can't there be a safe place that isn't solitary confinement? Why can't there be a unit for people with mental illnesses that isn't going to cause them to commit suicide or die by suicide within a year after they leave? These are the questions I ask. Um, so, just kind of moving on through the through the themes that we, we picked up on, you know, this idea of security versus therapy, 
clinicians always felt this conflict. They felt, you know, they say it's like a factory, and mental health really isn't the priority. And they said at the orientation, they're concerned about security. They don't even feel that they need a security. We're extra. We're looked at as extra. So these things would all be wonderful, but at the end of the day, they're only concerned about security. They're not necessarily concerned about fixing the individual as a whole or fixing the individual's mental health. You know, these are not, um, you know, groundbreaking discoveries. We know this. Um, and, you know, just hearing the clinicians testify to this bolsters our ethical concerns and claims about the, just the fundamental injustice of having folks, this many, this population behind bars. Right? We're not allowed to provide therapy, which is very, which I find very interesting. It's the case that in, in some of the jails we've worked in, they can, you know, therapists are not allowed to give therapy. They can dish out meds, but they can't actually have talk therapy sessions with folks. And if they do, it is um, the, the practice is to alternate therapists and move therapists around because their the security apparatus is afraid of confederating clinicians with with inmates, such that there might be an escape plan or something, or relationships, or so in they intentionally sabotage any therapeutic relationship that a therapist can form, and that doesn't do anybody any good, right? Maybe there was a case or two, in, you know, over the past ten years where a therapist had an affair or did something with it, but so now, at least in this one big jail, Philly, therapists are allowed to interact with the same people, you know, on multiple occasions, and. Uh, they're actively discouraged from having longitudinal therapeutic relationships. Not good. So how, you know, so, you know, this is another example. This is like, you know, a very stark image of group therapy at Pelican Bay Penitentiary in Northern California. These guys are in cages, essentially, and they're being treated, you know, they're being, um, they're engaged in group therapy. So, you know, this is not ideal. You know, some of these folks might say, actually, it's better than Nothing. They're, you know, at least we're getting therapy, and I feel safe in my cage uh, at the very least. But it doesn't seem to be the, to be the most therapeutic milieu uh, when individuals have to be inside cages. And so um, the APA statement stipulates that the services that are provided inside of jails and prisons should meet an ideal community standard, which is like a super aspirational goal. Because what's the community standard right now? Well. It's not great, and it's part of the problem. It's part of why these folks are inside these places. It's about the ideal community standard. So, you know, the idea that is that there should be, you know, drug formularies that match up with the best insurance plans on the outside. There should be clinicians involved who um, you know, have panels, you know, who are on insurance panels on the outside. There should be, you know, access to things like electric convulsive therapy, which many hospitals don't provide, which is, you know, standard line of treatment for severe depression. Um, so, you know, how can clinicians accept that what they can provide is simply just kind of good enough or, hold, you know, sort of a holding pattern in a very bad situation and it's better than nothing? Um, and so how, and how can clinicians truly provide therapy in, you know, this total institution that requires caged patients? The answer is I think they can't. They really can't. And we need to find a better solution. So, give you a sense of what that is in a few minutes. You know, dual agency. Another, you know, as I mentioned, big, big fundamental issue. The inmates see them as allies sometimes, or as part of the security apparatus. Other times, it erodes trust. Treatment again is better. The treatment is uh, in jail is better, um, better than nothing. Um, and, you know, that's a uh, another um, quote there that reinforces that point. Competency restoration treatment is another issue. Um, this is just an image that shows how long some folks inside. Of um, inside of Pennsylvania's jails, wait for competency restoration treatment at Norristown State Hospital. So these are folks who were not convicted of a crime but have been incarcerated pending trial. They're incapacitated and they've on average waited 297 days. Not convicted, they haven't been charged, they've been charged but not convicted. It seems like unconstitutional, like sort of false imprisonment to me. And sure enough, there was a lawsuit taken by the ACLU against the state that did in fact show that yes, this is a completely unacceptable. These individuals need to get competency restoration in short order. And so a bunch of money was spent to build more forensic beds at North Carolina State Hospital. Um, so I'll skip this one just in the interest of time and then get into the next uh, kind of my, uh, sort of section here, um, which is like, how can we 
um, fix this, this really, I think, dire situation? What can we do? What policies can we imagine? What kind of clinical interventions are out there that will um, potentially um, ameliorate this, this very big problem? And so, the, um, the, one of the big papers that, um, you know, to, in my career has been this paper, which stoked a lot of controversy. And it was a paper I wrote with Zeke, um, Zeke Emanuel and Andrew Siegel back in 2015. And, you know, part of the, um, the impetus for this paper was I had just started teaching in the psychiatry department, and a lot of these young psychiatrists I was teaching were just very morally distressed when they saw their patients come into crisis center, and then they'd have to, you know, they really could use hospitalization or long-term care, but there were no beds, so they were treated and treated. That's how they were. And they felt really, really um, just disturbed by that. And so that was one issue, and then, you know, this idea of mass incarceration and criminalization of mental illness, you know, these, just all this stuff, you know, kind of came um, at us at the right time when we, you know, thought, we need to make an ethical claim that we need psychiatric hospitals. It seems like a common sense then. You know, I knew that there was like a conversation in mental health policy and, and public health about this, and it was controversial. I didn't know it would be this controversial. And so when we wrote this paper, bring back, you know, sometimes we bring back the sign, that kind of got people kind of charged up. Um, but, you know, what we say here is that we're not looking for like, the old school asylums of the 50s and 60s, but rather even going back further to the you know, sort of um, era of moral therapy when the idea, uh, and, and that wasn't great either, but the idea was that uh, patients are human beings or persons and they should be treated with dignity, a revolutionary concept at the time when the Quaker reformers were starting their, their work. Um, and so, you know, we make this case that the asylum should be considered a place of safety and sanctuary place where people who are vulnerability should go. And that's the, really the, the actual meaning of the term. We hear it all the time in terms of political asylum, et cetera. And you know, dating back to the 1400s, 1400s and throughout the Middle Ages, this idea of safety and sanctuary for poor, for indigent people, people with mental illnesses. This is a, um, a painting um, of Friar Geoffrey, who uh, was a bishop of Valencia. He noticed this homeless man on the street um, being mocked and abused by the public and said, we need a place of safety and sanctuary for people who are like him, who can't um, survive on their own. And so he created the first asylum in 1409 in Valencia. Then in Philadelphia, we have the Friends Asylum, which was set up and founded by Thomas Scatterton. And across the country, Dorothea Dix wandered around and tried to convince state houses to build psychiatric hospitals. And, you know, we, um, you know, we argue in that paper there's a moral imperative, really, for policymakers to begin the process of funding and building ethically administered, affordable, and accessible psychiatric hospitals. Not just uh, to help, not just really the population who ends up in jail and prison, but, you know, obviously there's, that's that, the folks in this talk. Mentally ill individuals who are homeless or struggling in the community or are cycling through the ER, you know. The costs that are associated with serious, people with serious mental illness who have unstable housing and cycle through a year for, for basically primary care is staggering. So if we could get them to a place that's not the ER, uh, that, would be, that would be a, a big money saver. Um, they, you know, these places would be, um, they would offer long-term care treatment in the kind of orientation, the recovery-oriented way. Um, you know, the idea would be a place for individuals to rehabilitate and get back into the community. Lots of this is Worcester Community uh, Worcester um, Recovery Center, but there's plenty of other places. We're not looking to go back to bed, uh, obviously. And I'm just going to skip through some of these slides here because they're just me arguing with other people um, and countering arguments. I mean, I think you know the um, the idea of asylum. You know, what does that mean? What is a what should an asylum look like? And again, I draw Richard Lamb and Linda Weinberger here, who are at, who are at USC. And you know, they said the key functions of an asylum are to lower from one, lower stress, provide protection and social support, match demands for performance and capabilities, provide <coughs> services and supply structure. Many individuals inside jails and prisons who have committed nonviolent crimes would do well in that in a setting like that has those priorities, that has you know that structure. Um, and you know, we think about the the word asylum and it sounds scary, but you know, it's not, you know, even Oliver Sacks, the great neurologist who's written, you know, um, you know, dozens of books and thousands of pages of writing. You know, he, he wrote a great piece in the New York Review of Books back in like 2008, what was that, 10, 9, uh, 
uh, called The Lost Virtues of the, of the Asylum. And he talks about the way these places can be set up um, and, and should be set up to help individuals and families um, who are struggling with serious mental illness. And he, he describes a couple of different places that might be models for what I'm proposing. One is a place called Cooper Reese in Asheville, North Carolina. That's dubbed sort of a recovery college. It's uh, like a farmstead that has opportunities for folks to learn, you know, get work skills and activities and even like college, you know, college classes are there. But it is for individuals who, are, who have serious refractory mental illness. Um, it's a, um, an open sort of plant setting so that people can get around. It's not like a locked war type of place. And it, you know, it provides really, I think, robust mental health care. Problem is, oh, and I also mentioned the other one, Bull Farm, the other one that Sachs mentions. And Bull Farm is like an older place. It's been around since 1913. And again, it provides another sort of um, uh, therapeutic setting, um, farmstead setting for folks who have serious mental illness. The problem with these places, let me just take a sip here. The, these places are great. The problem is they're super expensive and they usually don't take private health insurance. So we're stuck again with this, this issue of access, even though there are places around where there's no access. So unless you have about, I don't know, 25, 30, 30,000 bucks to spend on a month of treatment, you're not going to, it's going to be out of reach. You know, Austin Ridge, for example, is like 55 to 60,000 for a six week um, you know, treatment rate. So, you know, we've got essentially, you know, Cadillac or Ivy League psychiatric hospitals or state hospitals. And really nothing in between that are, you know, scalable, and high quality, and accessible. Um, let me just, um, just look at the time here. There's a few, of, a few other, um, objections to this idea about creating more psychiatric spaces and beds that get people, um, get some, you know, folks who are critical of the piece animated, and, you know, and this might, you know, this is kind of germane for where we are here at the, at the School of Public Health, which is, you know, fundamentally it's psychosocial, biopsychosocial <clears throat> factors that are the root of the problem of, you know, the mass incarceration of individuals with serious mental illness, for example. And that is true, I mean, I think, the role of social disadvantage. This is just a paper by um, Trevor Hadley and um, and Mark Salzer up in Philly. Uh, you know they've shown that we must you know really account for the role of poverty and obviously draconian drug laws and the criminalization of individuals with mental illness. You know this these are things that are the root cause of poverty. The idea of fundamental injustices are the, often the cause of worse mental illnesses. And Dr. Salzer has repeatedly you know, criticize us for not drawing out that important relationship between poverty, mental illness, and incarceration. And admittedly, you know, his critique is, is on point. It is. But, you know, with respect, I'd say, you know, we, we know that poverty and, and, and social, socioeconomic status, you know, are, are root causes of lots of chronic illnesses. Um, yet, you know, like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, asthma, whatever you want to say. And we don't, like, we would, we'd find it odd if someone said, you know, we, we shouldn't treat these individuals in the right way at the right time in the right place. Rather, we should just focus on poverty. Like, we, could, we should do both, right? We, we should do both. And so I think that's kind of where I think we diverge, is, you know, for some reason, you know, this idea of mental illness as being really, uh, you know, rooted in, you know, social factors, some, sometimes, I think, you know, animates arguments that say you know, we should avoid a uh, sort of medical model to treat the people here and now. I, you know, I'm just saying we should be doing both. We should address these larger microscopic social problems, but also we can't forget about the people in front of us. And you know, this just to wrap up here, this is a um, uh, bit that, you know, it, this was a letter that was um, written in response to, to Mark's um, paper, in which um, the author says, you know, stating that incarceration of persons with mental illness is due to poverty rather than to possible never provable criminalization of mental illness does nothing to move these individuals out of jail and into treatment. No matter how many ways we study these forces as independent variables from the inside out, from the outside in, and no matter, and no matter what we call them, social problems or social constructions, poverty, mental illness, the end result is inevitably the same. Research is conducted, the complexities are noted, and a call for more research is made. Let this be the moment we move forward. That was by a woman named, uh, by, by uh, two researchers named uh, Margaret Severson and, and Alice Lieberman. Um, and I thought that was like such a great 
it <laughs> just affirmed for me like this impulse to say, oh, we've got to do both, we can do both, and we can't continually call for more research into these social factors. We need to actually become, you know, this is an emergency, actually. We're in the state, a state of emergency. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I don't know if we want to stop here, but I have a bunch more stuff. Um, let, me, uh, let me just close with this really nice paper by Steve Sharfstein and, um, and, and, and a few of his colleagues from Australia. In this, this, is a, um, this is a really neat paper because what he's doing, what they're doing is saying that the policy debate about community care versus inpatient care in the mental health policy, you know, uh, in the mental health policy world is really just a false dichotomy. And we shouldn't be thinking this way. And so they say, you know, um, it became clear that um, community versus inpatient was a false dichotomy and that folks on either side of the debate weren't really hearing each other at all. It's, you know, this is like a debate that, yeah, I didn't realize it was so hot. I knew it was hot, but I didn't realize it was so scorching hot until I published that paper. And part of, yeah, so what they say, so what Steve says here is he draws on um, Orwell's Animal Farm to make a really nice point. He says, you know, four legs good, two legs bad, bleed the sheep in unison to Orwell's Animal Farm to drown out intelligent criticism whenever it is raised. Community good, hospital bad, has been a similar ideological mantra for the past 60 years in psychiatric services. It was appropriate when we had whole mental hospitals in which many patients were mentally warehoused, but it has gone too far. We have forgotten the hospital component of community health service, even though it is essential to good practice. I really, I really like that, that point. And, and I, I have to end on it. I have to end by plugging my postdocs work, actually. Um, and this is a paper that was just recently published in Psychiatric Services by Isabel Pereira. Um, and, and she notes that, that inpatient hospitalization and, um, and community-based care are not, they, you know, it is a false economy. These are not substitutes for one another. They're complements. And she makes, she draws on her own really clever research on comparative mental health um, um, policies across the uh, European Union and shows that Actually, in places where there's a lot of psychiatric beds, there's also a lot of community uh, resources. So this idea that it's an all-or-nothing game, that this is a hydraulic model of you know, inpatient versus outpatient or community, is, is just a fallacy. So again, <laughs> the basic argument, incarcerated individuals deserve the mental health care treatment they need at the appropriate time and in the appropriate setting is the fundamental claim. The appropriate setting may be a psychiatric hospital. I've given you some reasons why I think that is. There are some objections to that idea, which I'm happy to continue to entertain if you want to raise them. Um, but you know, it's really time, I think, you know, fundamentally, that we add prisoner or incarcerated individuals, mental health and healthcare in general, to the agenda of bioethics in a very real way. And with that, oh, and a few people I have to thank Zeke, Aaron Glickman, Isabel Ferrer, Andrew Siegel, Steve Sharstein, and Elizabeth Sinclair. Thank you all.
um, individuals who need mental health services to get, gain access in a way that those two examples seem to show our gains from traction in similar but not exactly the same. Uh, yeah, so, great question. I think the, um, the word is now out among, among um, civil rights lawyers that, that these folks have a claim. And you know, I've been, I myself have been involved as an expert witness in some cases where it's clear that now we're, you know, the cat is out of the bag. This is a real deal. These are kind of like slam dunk cases in a lot of ways. If you could show that the correctional facility um, was deliberately indifferent. Now, that's a hard thing to prove sometimes, but it is the case that, you know, lawyers now see ACLU, you know, folks from the ACLU, the Defenders Associations, local prisoner advocate groups, that mental health care and health care in general is a right. And if it's not provided, then they have a case. Now, um, the the um, the example you just described of the of, of the new um, facility in LA. I, I was thinking you were going to ask me like, is that a good thing because it's going to be kind of like a warehouse? That's the related question. But yeah. Is that the right kind of facility? So I don't think it would. So this is this brings up another set of issues, which is like, how do we design these places that are ethically informed? And I was I was speaking with uh, Eileen and. And others about the way um, you know architecture, inform, you know architecture reflects our values, and um, and so I have a, a sort of another line of research on the ethics of architecture for psychiatric hospitals. The idea there is that you know we we don't want to make these places encampments, <laughs> concentration camps, whatever. When they look like you know like the worst of recovery center. I mean places that are legitimate medical institutions. I mean there there shouldn't you shouldn't even really be thinking about these facilities is any different than, than a hospital that Hopkins might build or that Penn might build. Um, uh, but they also should meet the needs of people where they are. So it doesn't necessarily mean that all these places should be hospital-like in big cities. They could be farmsteads or therapeutic communities or recovery colleges, whatever, in and around um, 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 different states, depending on what, what's needed. Now, um, the problem is scale and so and cost. And so, like, without a lot of being able to scale up these places, it's going to be hard to develop them in the right way. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, one thing would be to eliminate the IMP exclusion that prohibits the, the creation of, you know, what I think of as modern psychiatric hospitals. That's one policy. I mean, and others can tell me that there's other policy, maybe obstacles too. But, you know, that, that's one that I've kind of been fixing, fixating on. So, yeah, and, and you know, it gets scarier when you hear, you know, the, the Trump administration say, let's reopen psychiatric hospitals after a mass shooting. You know, I, yeah, that, that just became a whole other uh, set of issues that I had to, like, you because know, I got, you know, journalists were calling me saying, oh, so you really, you bring back the asylum guy, you must agree with Trump that, you know, now's the time to build these places to stop. And it's like, no, that, like, that's exactly the opposite of what I think, in fact. That's not what we want to do. So, yeah, there's, there's like a whole other set of arguments and discussion on, you know, on that. There's a few hands, okay. Thanks, so uh, very interesting, very compelling. I wanted to pick up on, um, I wanted to pick up on your sort of why not do both. So I, I like that as a reply to the sort of social model uh, critique. I guess I just wanted to hear more because I can imagine them sort of pushing back. So you might, you pointed out that prisons are barbaric generally. There are all kinds of health they go unmet in prisons. Um, so why not think that you know, targeting poverty, trying to make prisons better, especially if we have limited resources or something like that, might be a better way of getting at the root of some of these issues? Uh, so, so what's the question? So, yeah, so when, when, what would you say in response to this? So you said, well, we can do both. And I'm saying, well, why not prioritize the sort of social conditions and the way that these people advocate, especially if we have limited resources? I mean, I, yeah, so I mean, it's an allocated resource allocation model, and I, and I think in some cases we should, but in other cases the people that are sitting in front of us who need care right now and may actually, you know, and have a life in recovery that's functional and good, kind of deserve that kind of attention now and here and now. So maybe there's a sort of rule of rescue going on in my head that might not be, you know, totally coherent and airtight um, in every case, but that's kind of where I'm at in terms of triage. So I wanted to say hi. Hello. 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 Hello.
definition of mental illness, and I think I'm trying to get a direct quote something about uh, how there are certain cases in which behavior associated with mental illness is a proximate cause of their incarceration. Um, I was just wondering if there's any data on that, because I can imagine from my limited personal experience, there's many different ways that behavior associated with mental illness or mental illness diagnoses could be associated with um, incarceration. Um, so, yes, I mean, so the, so the debate about what counts as criminalization kind of tracks the debate about what, um, about priority setting in the community, for example. Um, and so, some would say, no, mental illness hasn't been criminalized, poverty's been criminalized, or, you know, other factors, like, you know, social economic factors have been criminalized. What I'm trying to say in this particular definition is that if somebody is, um, say, uh, making terroristic threats to somebody on the subway because they have schizophrenia, okay, that person will be adjudicated, will go, will get criminal justice, you know, involved in the criminal justice system. But that terroristic threat was because they're, they, they wouldn't be making a terrorist threat most likely, I can't say for sure, but it's most likely an artifact of their mental, their serious mental illness, is all I'm saying. And yeah. that's what gets them involved. Now, are there other things that might cause that or get them involved? Yes. Um, so, you know, we might say that crim the criminalization of poverty also will include a lot of mentally ill people, right? But just for purposes of this discussion, I wanted to keep it to like a very discreet group. Yeah, of course, and the definition makes sense to me. I was just curious, because there's many different ways, like, you know, for example, bad behavior get to some people a personality diagnosis, yeah. or, you know, substance use can get you something that would be both a legal charge, but also something that can be diagnosed with the DSM. Right. So I'm just trying to get a sense of, is there data, the lay of the land of those things versus, you know, paranoid schizophrenia? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, addiction in medicine, you know, there's a lot of overlap between individuals who have substance abuse disorders and the criminal justice system. And so, are we criminalizing addiction? One might ask, and you know that is that kind of what you think? Is that just what? So, uh, yes, but I guess maybe perhaps what do we know about these various causes that might end up summoning with both of these in prison? I know the next one of the yeah. next slides you have twenty one percent of depression, six percent with personality disorders. I didn't see substance use on that list. Yeah, I'm just no, curious about okay. what are some of these causes that in the population that end up. Yeah, I and mean, I think what will happen is that these illnesses will generate behaviors that are, you know, essentially, you know, violating, you know, other people's rights or committing crime. So if I'm hearing, if you're, I don't know if I'm getting your question completely, 100% clear here, but, but, um, that not being clear, but <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, but no, I think, I think what you're on here, you're asking is like, is it really, how do you determine proximate causes is kind of what you're asking me, and, and, and what are the data for that? And, and, you know, I think it's reflected and in, in, in basically, um, you know, the, there's, there's been studies that have shown that people who have serious mental illnesses or, and or substance abuse disorder have a higher rate of incarceration and recidivism. Those, those are things that we know. So, um, yeah, it is the case that the fundamental issues that got them in that way, you know, the poverty or the toxic stress they've been around or the adverse childhood experiences, those are bad and we need to fix those. But, you know, we're talking about the level of the disorder itself. Yeah. I hope one, one more has a question. Great. Hi. Um, I will try to keep this quick. I have a question from the 19th century, um, which is that one of the sort of issues with the reform movements that I see in 19th century um, to give one example, I recently read a pamphlet from like the 1870s that was trying to divide out ordinary drunkenness and dipsomania. So we have pathological version right. and non-pathological version of the same action, yeah. which basically was just like whether you were poor or rich. But um, they were praising a new law that said ordinary drunkards um, should have increased punishment. We should be treating them more harshly, with more judgment, send them for six months to the poorhouse to work. Dipsomaniacs we should be caring for them and giving them sympathy, and we should put them in these specialized institutions for four years where they can't leave. And so, like, yeah. so at the same time, you have this sort of hyper-stigmatization of the non-pathological variation and actually increased management yeah. and containment of the people who were being pathological. And I'm not saying that's what's happening here, but right. like that, that tension seems like something that might still Exist. resonate. So yeah. I'm wondering if, yeah. if you have any thoughts about that. 
No, I do. I mean, I think, well, first off, we, we, we know a lot more now. And, and, you know, so that definitely is, you know, has changed the way we handle the, um, the way folks with mental illnesses are, are treated. Um, but it is the case that, and, I saw, and I'm going to talk about this in my seminar with the postdocs, that some mental illnesses really are socially laden to the degree that, you know, when we think about interventions or confinement, it's not always about the biology and the, and, and the neuroscience. It's, there's other things happening. So, and the case we'll talk about is borderline personality. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, uh, I, I do hope things have improved, though, since the 1870s. So, <laughs> you get your chance. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Good. Thank you, Bob, so much.